Hi everyone, good evening. I am here with the latest on um, my week in review. I am so sorry that I am late, but you can catch the replay on Instagram or you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. The link is in the bio. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram and the um, link in the bio on Twitter is there. And the clips will also be on Twitter too. So welcome. So y'all yeah, know I like to get into the um, COVID. We're 23 months into it as of Sunday. Hi, um, Mr. Mentally Divine. We are in COVID. So according to the John Hawkins University in Medicine website, the global confirmed case is at 390,833,248. So that's a lot. Global death toll is at 5,724,931. U.S. confirmed cases are at 76,354,040. U.S. death toll is at 901,388. So we are very close to a million people dying from COVID in United States of America. And we're only, people say we're 5% of the, the world's population. I thought we were 20%. Maybe my numbers are off. But those who came on, hello, everyone. So just to recap on these numbers from the university, the John Hopkins University website. The website is like right here. You can always catch it daily because the numbers changes daily. So global confirmed cases are at 390,833,248. Global death toll is at 5,724,931. U.S. confirmed cases are at 76,354,040. And the U.S. death toll is at 901,388. So, yeah, we passed 900,000. So we're at a million people dying or deceased from COVID-19. In the United States of America. According to the vaccination doses, as of yesterday, 719,985 people have been, um, had they doses. So overall, the U.S. is at 65% of fully, being fully vaccinated. So the total amount of people fully vaccinated in the United States is 212.3 million. And why am I saying all of this? With over 390 million people affected with COVID, over 5 million people dead. In the United States, over 76 million people infected with COVID and over 900,000 people dead. Why am I saying this? Because people are still being stupid here. I find myself to say this damn speech every goddamn week. It's like talking to toddlers. And even toddlers and school age children have more sense than we do. They do. They were excited when the vaccine was available to them. And as of the end of this month... Kids under the age of five will receive their first dose of vaccine. And will they be able, they will be, it will be available to them. Will parents comply? I don't know. Some of these parents are not vaccinated themselves, which for whatever reason, I don't fucking understand. But with over 370 million people around the world affected with COVID, over 5 million dead, Almost 80 million people infected with COVID here in the United States. Over 900,000 people are dead and people still not understanding. And some just don't give a fuck. So here we are, month 23, into this deadly virus. By next month, 
it will have been declared, it will be the mark the two year anniversary that this nation made COVID-19 a national public health emergency. We have three vaccines on deck and people are still spewing anti-vax rhetoric. We have people with large astronomical followings both on Instagram, Twitter, and even Facebook peddling this misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccine and the virus overall. And those same people pushing that rhetoric, some of them are dying from COVID or some of them will catch COVID again if they had it before. And I know there's going to be some people in my mentions going to talk about, well, you know, why you you pushing people to get vaccinated? You took the vaccine. You're going to get sick. Wishing stuff on people will actually be your karma. So if you want to wish me to get sick, guess what? You're going to catch COVID. And I don't try to wish things on people. But when you keep putting bad juju on others, it will come back to you tenfold. But as I make this speech to those who refuse to get vaccinated after over 300 million people, damn near almost 400 million people around this world has been affected with COVID. Almost 6 million people has been dead from this virus. Nearly 80 million people are affected with COVID here in the United States. And damn near almost, almost a million people dead and y'all still pushing this rhetoric, you will find out about this virus. I don't want people to fuck around and find out, but if you keep peddling these lies about the vaccine and the virus itself, you will find yourself on the ventilator. And then you will wish that you would took the vaccine and took this virus seriously. That's why it's important to get vaccinated and still wear your mask. You're not exempt from this virus. No one is. No matter how healthy you are, you're lucky to survive this and have asthma. Some people' body is not equipped to surviving this, no matter if they're immunocompromised or not. Your ass will die. Point blank in the period. I have a doctor that I work with at Trumper, and he's that's a Trumper, and he's been on the ooh. Yeah. No, it's like I find myself to like make this speech like every week. Like I'm 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 tired. I am tired of telling people to get the vaccine. I am tired of telling people to wear their masks. I, I've been saying this shit since 2020. I've been telling you to wear your mask. And when the vaccine came out, I've been telling you to wear your mask and get vaccinated. But obviously, people don't take things serious they're not taking this virus seriously people are walking around here affecting others like that's the fucking thing to do i told people look if your ass don't want to get the vaccine don't be around me i have a compromised immune system and i'm boosted i have anemia i don't have it as bad as my sisters but i have anemia And if you and if you want to, you know, F around and not wear your mask, you will find out. You will find the fuck out. Because that once you're on that ventilator, you have a 10% chance of getting off. 90% of the time, your ass don't get off the ventilator. You find yourself up there with Herman Cain if, he, if he's even up there. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. He laying up in that hospital. And absolutely, Queen. But uh, I am going to move on to the politics. So, you know, the Biden and Harris administration had a very good week. Let's start with, yes, I had to to go on there with Herman Cain and Meatloaf probably singing to him somewhere. They somewhere. I don't know if they up there, but they somewhere in the middle or they somewhere like down below. I don't know where they are. Absolutely. He ain't coming off that shit. So. 
Joe Biden and Kamala Harris had a very good week. So this week we learned that the ISIS leader in the U.S. led Syria raid has been killed. So according to CNN, because that's where I'm getting my news source from, ISIS leader Abu Ibrahim, can't pronounce the other names, was killed Wednesday during a U.S. counterterrorism raid in northwest Syria, President Biden announced Thursday morning. It was the biggest U.S. raid in the country since 2019 operation that killed ISIS leader Abu Bakr Baghdadi. Al Baghdadi. This leader blew himself up as U.S. forces approached his compound. Biden administration officials said an explosion resulted in multiple civilian casualties. Those there were, those were a discrepancy between the Biden administration and the Syrian, and the Syrian, and the Syrian civil defense group. How over how many? There were no U.S. casualties, according to the Pentagon. Biden spoke with the White House, with the, excuse me, with the White House Thursday morning to announce the operation that had taken a major terrorist leader off the battlefield, saying the U.S. was chosen, saying that the U.S. was chosen to use special forces the operation in order to minimize civilian casualties. Thanks to the bravery of our troops, this horrible terrorist leader is no more. Biden said that the in the um, Roosevelt room, knowing that terrorists had chosen to surround himself with family, including children, we had made a choice to pursue special forces and raise a much greater risk. And the Pentagon press secretary John Kirby said in a statement late Wednesday night that the mission was conducted by the U.S. Central Co Command, which controls military options and activities in Middle East. In the Middle East, so. This is actually pretty good for the um, the administration. And everybody saw the vice president in the situation room. Because as the president has stated, when he was the candidate, that the last person in the room, he wants someone that will tell him the truth, even it hurts. And the vice president will tell him the truth. If you saw the debates, how she told him the truth about his um, policy on busing, you know she was going to tell him the truth about the whole Syrian thing. That's how when he was a presidential candidate running against President Obama before he was nominated as his vice, chosen as his vice president, Joe Biden told him the truth about himself. So it's like you want someone to tell you the hardcore truth. So that's why you saw the VP in the situation room. And this is a win for the Biden and Harris administration. I'm wondering what Republicans are saying about, you know, this uh, Syrian raid of one of the ISIS leaders being killed. Because I haven't heard not a peep from Raphael, not a peep from Ronald Johnson, not a peep from Lindsey Olengram. Not a peep from Addison Mitchell McConnell. I have not heard a peep from the Peanut Gallery. I haven't heard a peep from the Grand Insurrectionist Party's pundits. Hint, Megan Marguerite McCain. I haven't heard not a goddamn thing. They've been super duper quiet. But they're supposed to be the, the party of law and order. The party of globalism the party of humanitarian efforts the party of reagan they supposed to be the party of foreign policy so where was y'all when this news was announced y'all want to be defenders of democracy defenders of democracy defenders of allies our foreign allies but you sure was quiet when this news came out why was y'all quiet i'll wait for that response because why because they don't want this administration to succeed
They're still salty about their dear leader losing to the former vice president of the United States that had credibility. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And then when we get to the jobs report. So we got to talk about the jobs report. So I want to see where is the news alert for that one. Let's see. Okay, give me a second. Jobs report. So according to CNBC, payroll shows surprisingly powerful gain of 467,000 in January despite Omicron surge. So, job growth rose far more than expected in January despite surging Omicron cases that seemingly sent millions of workers to the sidelines, the Department of Labor reported today. Also, payroll surged by 467000 for each month, while unemployment rate edged higher to 4%, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The Dow Jones estimated was the, for the payroll growth of one, um, 150000 and a 39 unemployment rate. The stunning gain came from a week after the White House warned that the numbers could be low due to pandemic. So these numbers are at 152. They are at 5 million. I can't even read. 449.6 million in payroll plus the 467k um back in December. COVID cases however has plunged national in weeks. When seven-day moving average down to more than 50%, peaking in January, according to the CDC. Most economists said had expected January's numbers to be tippet due to the virus, though they were looking for stronger gains ahead. Along with the big upside surprise for January, massive revisions sent previous months considerably higher. December, which initially was reported as a gain of 190,000, 99,000 went up to 510,000. November surged to 647,000 from previous, previously reported 249,000. For the two months alone, the initial accounts were revised by the 709,000. The revisions came a part of the annual adjustment from the viewer labor statistics that saw sizable changes for many of the months in 2021. So, to sum all of this up, because I don't want to read the whole thing too much, this administration has saw better gains. Even in the spite of wave number four, wave number five, with this new variant called Omicron, numbers still went up in terms of either if it's temp temporary jobs or permanent jobs, those went up, which it's good for the economy. And even the infrastructure bill has everything to do with that too on those projects, right? I want to know, with all of this good news, where are the fiscal conservatives? Lindsay Olin Graham. Timothy Scott, Addison Mitchell McConnell, Roy Blunt. Where are they? Lisa Mikowski, Joni Ernst. Where are they? Thomas Cotton, Joshua David Harley. Where are y'all? I'm 
aren't you guys supposed to be happy the economy is moving in a good direction? No, because this guy's not a part of your party. But y'all tout this unity bullshit. That's crazy. Isn't it crazy? This administration had a good week. The whole ISIS thing, taking down one of the ISIS leaders, the economy, the jobs, because y'all all bitched about inflation. Even though you guys are the reason why this inflation, blame your dear leader, the bum, the former bum. But y'all quiet on these things. I don't understand. Do you? See, the Grand Insurrectionist Party, formerly known as the Grand Old Party, the Party of Lincoln, the Party of Reagan, the Party of Eisenhower. You guys don't care about the economy. I mean, after all, Reaganomics, did it really help everybody? I don't think so. No. Because we're still dealing with the trickle-down economics from Reaganomics today. This is 41 years later. We're still dealing with this bullshit. Literally still dealing with this bullshit. That's why we got so much systemic issues within our job sectors, the banking sectors, the investment banking sectors. There's not enough black representation when it comes to black women because of Reaganomics. Reaganomics was bullshit. Ronald Wilson Reagan was not for the people or by the people. So therefore, Republicans crap up a good economy. They ride the coattails of the Democratic incumbent president on their hard work to improve the economy for the average worker. And when they get in office, they bastardize that. They do. Clinton, I mean, excuse me, I could say FDR cleaned up the economy. Let's see. John F. Kennedy, LBJ, Carter, Clinton, despite his personal business, President Obama, and now President Biden. We thank the Democratic Party for cleaning up the economy. Because if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't have health care. You wouldn't have been able to buy cars, houses, have a bank account, have the blue collar job that you have. I mean, let's be honest. What does the GOP stand for? Excuse me, the GIP. What do they stand for? I'm waiting. Because honestly, the Grand Insurrectionist Party don't stand for anything. In the 80s, you could say they slightly stand for something. Fiscal conservatives. That's code for cutting programs that help kids and underserved communities. That was manufactured by Richard Nixon. Tricky dick. And who cut those programs? Ronald Wilson Reagan and company. And the Bushes, mm, they were no better. The only thing they did was a Clean Air Act, and that was Daddy Bush. Other than that, mm, not, not, not great times. Junior Bush is the reason why there's so much high student debt. 
why um, people in my generation are not able to get the jobs they get right away because of that administration. And I went to college during that administration. My tuition went up every goddamn year. But to sum it up, I'm going to just say this. Democrats deliver. They've been delivering for over 90 years. They've been delivering on economic prosperity, education, prosperity, equity. Are they a perfect party? No. But when it comes to delivering for the American people, they write on time. Because the Grand Insurrectionist Party, formerly known as the Grand Old Party, formerly known as the party of Eisenhower, Lincoln, Reagan, they don't deliver for the people. And they're not going to. And they're worse than ever. They are much worse since 1964 and 1980. And that's the goddamn truth. We are all known that Lindsey Graham is a power button bottom of the GOP, GQP. You used to call it the Grand QAnon Party. I call it the Grand Insurrectionist Party because they harbor a lot of um, insurrectionists. The people who have the audacity to say these are not different between the two. And that's another thing. Oh, I'm going to get into to the progressives' ass soon. But I would like to move on to what the administration will have next. The administration will definitely, um, they have more to do. So people just need to patiently wait. In terms of the midterms, I know there's a lot of people tweeting about the midterms, about the Senate, Senate races and about the congressional races. Um, I got to see who's primary in um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, in the 14th Congressional District in New York because you know I live in New York. She's not my um, congresswoman. It's actually Adriano Espiat. So, let's see. AOC primary challengers. Okay. Nope. Let's go to Ballot Media. Ballotpedia. There we go. All right. Let's see who ate her challengers because that information has not come out yet. Okay, her information has not come out. That information has not come out yet. Oh, you know what? I see it right here. This is where I see it. Um, Eduardo Monero. She got a lot of Republicans ch um, challenging her. That Tina crazy one is challenging her. But this Eduardo guy... Um, he is running to represent the 14th Congressional District. And I'm going to do more research on this guy. But she got a lot of Republicans challenging her. Because Republicans are trying to unseat her ass. Literally. So. But you got a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of. Uh, there's only one Democrat that's challenging her. So hopefully this challenger is good. She had better challengers the last time. But. um. Yeah, everybody is making a big deal about this uh, senatorial race. And I get there's people in the KHOB and KHOB adjacent folks are split between the candidates of Malcolm Kenyatta and Connor Lamb. Now, y'all know me. I love me 
some Malcolm King yada, and I am a full supporter behind him. But if he does not get the nomination, then I will um, back the candidate that wins. But I am not giving up on a candidate. I didn't even give up on Maya Wiley during the New York mayoral races when she was endorsed by numerous of um, progressive um, candidates. Not progressive candidates, press progressive organizations, excuse me. But I I still did not shy away from her. I ranked her. I ranked her and Adams on the top of my ticket because I was for somebody that was ready to take on because they were serious. I even ranked Diane uh, Morales. I ranked her. But we can agree to disagree on Malcolm Kenyatta. Or Connor Lamb. I have no problem with that. But the fact that it's getting tribal, that's a problem for me. I am not the type of person to slander people. And now if you say some stupid or some dumb shit, then I'm going to come after you. But if you're just giving your opinion, that's fine. I got no problem with that. Even though all those progressive endorsements are kind of like a little shaky for Malcolm... But Malcolm is still a serious candidate, in my opinion. And Connor Lamb is a serious candidate, too, because I got no problem with him. But his fundraising is, is, you know, it's a little shaky ground. It's a little shaky ground. You know, the other two candidates have more endorsements and have more money, which that's understandable. But don't count people out that's just my thing because the primaries is supposed to be competitive and a competitive primary is better than nothing anyone but Fetterman I don't care if it's Kenyatta or Lamb even though I do prefer Kenyatta but if it's Lamb that's fine as long as it's not John Carl Fetterman I am all for it. And y'all can call me this neoliberal corporate shell because I'm not. Because that's not my type. Because I told people time and time again, I do not define myself in no goddamn ideology. People try to put me in the box. Some people think I'm a radical leftist. Some people think I'm a progressive. Some people think I'm a centrist. Some people think I'm a moderate. I am none of that bullshit. Some people think I'm conservative. And I'm just like looking at them like, motherfucker, are you serious? Like I am straight up, straight up a concerned, pragmatic voter. That's just me. So if you have a problem with me not defining the ideology, you can kiss my whole ass. Because I said what the fuck I said. I lost about two, three followers because I speak truth. It may be a little bit harsh, but I speak truth. Some people want to come in my message and try to police me. Don't, don't police this one because you will fuck around and find out. You will find the fuck out. You will find the fuck out so bad that you will want to block me or want to report me. Don't fucking do it. Because I'm not the fucking one. Hi, Jan. But, um, hi, everyone that came on. So, yeah. But as I said about this whole primaries, like I said, anybody, I don't care if it's Malcolm Kenyatta or Connor Lamb, I don't care who wins. As long as it's not John Carl Fetterman, I am all for it. Point blank, period. And more of, you know, good, my gubernatorial race, because I know everybody's like tired of me talking about the gubernatorial race. So, you know, I was team Letitia Ann James for governor. And this is no shade to Kathy Hochul. But Kathy Hochul was never really my cup of tea. Even when she was a lieutenant governor, she was not my cup of tea. I prefer Andrew Cuomo could have picked somebody that was black. But, you know, who am I? But as I said, 
I will vote for her because I don't really care for my public advocate who's running. And Tom, I don't like Tom Swazi's racist ass. So Kathy Hochul seemed like the only good choice at this time. Because my preferred candidate dropped out to run for um, re-election. Well, we all know who fault that is. And some people will get mad. Jay Jacobs is not a good chairman. I have said that time and time again. He is culturally incompetent. He is culturally incompetent to be our chair. But my AG, Letitia Ann James, who is coming for... The bums, the trumps of Queens Village. She's coming for their ass. So I am all for it. But I do not want, and I know people are going to get mad. I do not want people to congratulate her after she comes from them. Because the same people that's congratulating her are the same motherfuckers that criticize her run for governor. And that blamed her for the resignation of Andrew Cuomo. If they even say congratulations or you're American hero, I'm cursing all of them the fuck out in a video. I might even do a live cursing them bitches out. And I don't give two fucks. Because don't congratulate her doing her job when you guys were all motherfucking against her. Because you guys were. I said what I said. But back to my support, I will support Kathy Hochul. But if she does win her primary and does win the does win the gubernatorial race, she needs to reach more out to black and brown, Latino, Asian American, and LGBTQ voters. Because that and Jewish voters, because that's the coalition that will put you in. That is the coalition that will actually make sure that you win. Because half of these white women, they're not dependable. And truth to be told, not a lot of them like Kathy Hogan. So, therefore, I will like Governor Hochul, if her people is listening, focus on building a diverse coalition. Stop relying on the white feminists to vote for you because they will run home to the GOP. And I feel like half of them will run home to Lee Zeldin. You're going to need people like me, the most reliable Democratic voter. So please focus on us, Kathy Hoko. Don't be afraid to go to the hood. Don't be afraid to go to small churches in New York City. Don't be afraid of New York City. And that's my advice to you. Now it's time to read the shit out of people. It's not going to take me that long because I don't want to be on here an hour because it's a big file. I don't want to make it too much of a big file. So y'all all know I had words with um, Miss Liz Wheeler, the Republican pundit who used to work for o ONN. Now she um, is a podcaster, low budget podcaster that don't get that many likes and retweets and shit. So we had words of exchange. And these words of exchange were, you know, they were interesting. So... Let's start with Liz calling me the leader of the K-Hive. So she said this is a snippet. She said this. Republicans, as Republicans have no problem criticizing somebody who is a member of our own party or our own movement, Democrats are the ones that want to sick a swarm of K-Hive members on you if you dare to disagree with one of their candidates. Ronald Reagan should not have done that, just like Joe Biden shouldn't do it now. So this is not the gotcha that the left thinks it is. Not, not even close. Not even close here. Um, also, Shantae accuses me of carrying water for white men. And the, how do I even say this? Okay, right now, Jay Hay is hooting in my ear because um, he says, he says, I've never carried any water for him. He's the one who always carries all the water around here, which, you know, is more like less accurate here. But th this is what the left does. They have no substantial answer 
to our arguments. I'm happy to have a civil conversation, a debate with Shantae. That's why I responded to her when she just said that I was demonstrating racial bias or whatever but this is what they do they don't respond with any substance they just respond with accusations that you are a white supremacist accusations that you are somehow subservient to men or that you carry water for white men that that's not in fact true but if you want to talk about racism let's talk about racism because there is racism that is happening right now right here in this conversation between shantae and i and it's not coming from me the racism is coming from her conservatives and liberal So, apparently Liz did not read what I wrote. So, I would like to share what I wrote about, wrote to Miss Wheeler. It starts off, literally, it starts off with uh, this. So, because I know I I went in because it started off with me replying, quoting her tweet, saying she is exposing her racial biases. So I said, I read your tweet and honestly, it's absolutely BS. What you don't understand, Liz, is that black women have long been denied to serve in the highest chambers and offices in our government since the birth of this nation. Of course, that doesn't matter to you, right? So it's okay for then President Ronald Reagan, Ronald Wilson Reagan, to make a campaign pledge that he will nominate a woman on the su Supreme Court without bringing up her qualifications. But it's okay. But it's but it's not okay for President Biden, who also made a campaign campaign pledge to nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court. I mean, the proof is in the pudding because he made the similar pledge, but it's just not a black woman, a white woman. Just like President Reagan made a campaign promise, so did President Biden. And he promised to nominate a black woman during the 2020 primaries, and then he's following through. So this is what I said. I think the administration will have an opportunity to appoint someone to the court. Number one, I committed that if I'm elected president, have an opportunity to appoint someone to the courts. We'll be, I'll appoint the first black woman to the courts. It's... The video is, is in my thread. I said, so I asked you, what's the difference between Reagan making this campaign pledge versus President Biden? It's obvious. It's sure that it's with you Republicans. Either way, black women are hardly qualified to serve in that Supreme Court. And no, he's not picking up because of a random, any random black person. He's not picking them of their race. Black women have long been denied offices and higher executive chambers. In this country. Why in 2021. there Or 2022. Excuse me. There is still the first black this. The first black woman that. The first black woman this. This year we will finally elect. The first black woman governor in this country. That makes no goddamn sense. In the world. To my knowledge. But Liz. Instead of. Having this conversation with me, she decided to dedicate 45 minutes of her 55-minute podcast to yours truly. So as I dragged her ass last night, and I'm going to do it again, to Liz Wheeler, you did not want to have a genuine conversation with me. If you want to have a civil and genuine conversation with me, you could have invited me to your podcast. So we could have had this conversation, this dialogue. And I would have provided you with this information and more information to back up my claim of then President Ronald Reagan making a similar pledge that President Biden is doing. And no, it's not hurting women. It's actually empowering us because we have been the back burner. We have been the subservient women in the back. We have not been the women in the forefront. Because why? Because it's white men that you carry water for because you do putting us to the back burner because they are afraid that black women are going to take power from them it's all about 
power and upholding white supremacy. And as a woman, you should understand white men are the biggest threat and the most disliked people around the world. But obviously, you don't seem to understand that. And that's why I said you're carrying water for white men because you also don't give a fuck. But as I said, Eliz um, excuse me, Liz, because your name is not Elizabeth. As I said, you can record this on your podcast and continue to criticize me because the more you criticize me, the more people are going to flock to my page and follow me because I'm right. And you're wrong. As always. That's why you don't have no job now at One American News. So, I dragged her ass way too much. I, I had two videos dragging her, so this is the last part. Also, two progressives. Let me just say this to the progressives. Government doesn't work overnight. Let's see. Black women are are more qualified to serve on the Supreme Court. Why would you want to put a person there because of the ideology, which is stupid, or say nominate this white woman because we don't want a black woman of the president's choice on the Supreme Court proves that you guys are not allies for us. You're not for us or by us. You guys ain't fubu. You guys ain't shit. I don't care how many black progressives you throw in our face, the Breonna Graves of the world and the Nina Turners of the world, which I don't know why she's running for Congress again like she going to win. You guys ain't allies. White progressive men and some white progressive women that carry water for those white men are not allies to us. You guys ain't for us and by us, you guys ain't fubu. And to the Republican Party, and mainstream media included. This narrative of Democrats are in a disarray. The RNC led by Rona Romney McDaniel. Censured both Adam Kissinger and Elizabeth Cheney. All because they did not spew the big lie. I mean, the Arizona Democratic Party censured Kirsten Lee Cinema, but the National Party didn't censure her. So this you can tell where the Democratic Party is. Even though we disagree with each other on ideology and policy, but when it comes to wanting stuff for the country, we're all on the same page. We just want it in a different way. Versus the Republican Party. You guys just stand for nothing. You guys are bums. And you guys are just a mess on Twitter and just behind. You guys are just a mess overall. But the fact that you sent you your same Republicans. It's crazy. And just a backup history to um, a backup history on Elizabeth Lynn Cheney and Adam Daniel Kissinger. They know heroes. They voted against the Voting Rights Act, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, the American Rescue Plan, the Build Back Better agenda. They voted against all of that. They're not our friends. I wish people will stop making them some type of fucking heroes just because they serve on the one six community committee. Excuse me. They are not our friends. They never been and they never will be. So please stop retweeting them. Please stop saying I'm here for you man or here for you girl. And stop retweeting the, the Lincoln Project too. That's another thing. Because they're not for us neither. They're not even champion for the American Rescue Plan and all the other plans that will help the middle of the, the middle class people in this country and the working class. So once again, I said, Elizabeth Lynn Cheney, Adam Daniel Kissinger, and the Lincoln Project are not our friends. 
No matter how much the Lincoln Project helped us in 2020, they're not our friends. Adam Daniel Kissinger and Elizabeth Cheney voted against the American Rescue Plan, the George Floyd Justice and Police Act, the um, American, I said the American Rescue Plan, Build Back Better Agenda. They voted against a lot of legislation that will help their constituents and the rest of the people in this country. They are not our friends. They are not our friends and they will never be our friends. Point blank, point blank period. So as I go to sleep tonight, because it's almost one o'clock, I think I've been on here for almost an hour. Please, please stay on top of things. Vote, 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 vote on the top ticket and down ballot. That's important because we need, we need, 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 need to maintain this democracy because the democratic party is the only party right now that seems like they care about the democracy versus the grand insurrectionist party and that includes elizabeth lynn cheney and adam daniel kissinger so that's what i got to tell you stay safe stay warm and have a blessed and wonderful weekend and remember to subscribe to the youtube channel and follow me on twitter and follow brian dr c and kenny on twitter and instagram and subscribe to Kenny's YouTube page, Dr. C YouTube page, and Brian's YouTube page as well. Thank you so much and have a wonderful night.